Glad you can join us this morning. Look forward to hearing some inspiring content today from Kylie, which we'll introduce very shortly. For those who don't know me, uh, I'm Dan. I'm one of the national program managers and trainers at Smart Recovery, and that's Ted, you heard there. Uh, and I see a few names that I have recognised, a lot of names I don't, which is uh, very exciting to see a community growing. The webinar will run for about an hour. Um, and for those that did register, there'll be a recording available afterwards. So we'll send that through at some point. Um, and also just uh, look at the website content on our website. The, there's uh, the webinar content. There's lots of other fantastic webinars and content there for you guys. Uh, normally the housekeeping is me telling people where the toilets and fire exits are. So uh, I assume you know where they are, wherever you're logging in from today. Um, but in the virtual world, for the most part, all you need to know that there is a chat box function and a Q&A section, which I'm going to jump on and manage. Uh, as I said, we will introduce uh, the speaker today, or April will, and we will have a, a Q&A session at the end. So please feel free to add any questions you have um, directed at Kylie or in general for Smart Recovery, then we'd love to try and get most to these questions at the end. So I'm going to uh, jump off uh, and manage that chat box and Q&A function. I'll see you later in the Q&A. But I now have the privilege uh, to introduce Smart Recovery's new CEO. Uh, and I think you're on day 50 something, April. So I'll hand over to her to complete the introductions and the welcomes. So yeah. Thanks, Dan. And um, welcome to everybody. I um, am very um, excited to have this webinar today. And following cultural protocols, I want to begin by acknowledging the country that I'm joining you on, which is a Wabakal country, and pay my respects to elders, both past and present. And of course, acknowledge the country that everybody else is joining us from. I think it's really important um, in acknowledging country that we just take a moment to acknowledge mob who are currently supporting a loved one who's struggling with addiction. Um, they might be somebody in community or they might be somebody currently incarcerated due to the criminalization of addiction in our country. I'm incredibly proud to be the first Aboriginal CEO of Smart Recovery Australia. Um, I want to acknowledge my old people who have supported me to be here today. My mob is from the central coast and mid-north coast of New South Wales. So whilst Dark and Jung country is not too far away, I'm very much a visitor on these lands and acknowledge this country. So Kylie Captain is our guest speaker today. I'm, I'm really excited to introduce Kylie. Um, it's really important that we share the stories of success, the true stories, um, because often we talk about the statistics. And for us, um, they're not just statistics, when we talk about addiction, uh, they're brothers, sisters, cousins and, and family. What we don't see enough of in the mainstream media is the stories of resilience, the stories of breaking cycles. And I've actually had the privilege of, of seeing that um, with Kylie's children um, at the National Centre of Indigenous Excellence. So when we talk about breaking cycles, young leaders uh, doing great work in their community, and of course, I, I know exactly where they get it from. Um, so Kylie um, is a proud Gamilaroi woman, born and raised in Redfern, Waterloo. Uh, she's an educational leader, uh, president of the Aboriginal Studies Association, and author of Dream Big and Imagine the What If. So today's story is one that should be shared and celebrated. And I'm really excited to open the sharing circle and to have Kylie share her story. And then uh, we'll have some Q&A at the end. So I'll hand over to Kylie. Oh, thank you, sis. I'm getting a bit teary. I always get teary, actually, when I hear people introduce me. I'm like, well, I often pinch myself and going, wow, is that really me? Did I really, you know, break through that cycle? And is this, you know, I often have to every single day I wake up and um, just with extreme gratitude, you know, the fact that I'm here, the fact that I have this opportunity to share my yarn. So um, a very big thank you to April and Dan and the team at Smart Recovery for, um, for the work that you do and for allowing me the opportunity to come and uh, be part of today's yarn. Um, I do um, have a couple of slides to share as well, so I might try and, um, and share them um, just as I take you through my yarns today. But uh, firstly, just share yeah, a very good morning to everyone. Um, thank you very much uh, for joining the webinar today. Um, it's an absolute honour to be here. Um, if you're watching the recording uh, later on as well, a big hello to you and thank you for giving us your time. I hope that uh, the information that I share with you today is helpful either for yourself or maybe someone um, 
who um, you might be working with or a family member, as April mentioned. Um, you know, I, I continue to do this work day in, day out on myself, but also to support those around me, including my family um, who, who still struggle with addiction. So I, I understand this um, space uh, very well, but I'm going to share screen. Um, Oh, okay. Um, Dan, you might have to add me as co-host again because it's saying participants um, disabled. So, oh, yeah, I'm good now. All right. Just bear with me. All right. You can see my, um, yep, you can see my screen. Excellent. All right. Um, so, yeah, look, um, as I mentioned, I, I have to try to like um, compose myself when I hear those introductions and the fact that um, it's been a, a goal of mine to actually write a book, to be brave enough to share my story. Um, and I did publish my book at the National Centre of Indigenous Excellence uh, in December last year. That was actually my primary school, um, that primary school where I sat up the back of the class is feeling like the dumbest kid um, around and didn't, didn't ever think that I would achieve anything in my life. So to take it back there and actually have my book launched there in December last year, was um, pretty surreal for me but also uh, following protocol I just want to acknowledge you know that I'm dialing in today from beautiful Darawa country I'm in southwest Sydney and I'm a proud Gamilaroi woman so my mom is from Walgood a small country town in northwest New South Wales where um, I was lucky enough to have two mums actually where both my mums and my nan were born on the banks of the Namai River um, they lived in tin shacks there over in Namai Reserve um, so I acknowledge the land on which I dial in from today and I also acknowledge the land on which you're all on as well and, and ask the ancestors and the old people of that land to be with us today and to continue to nurture us and provide us with the healing and the support that we need. Um, I always acknowledge my old people um, and in particular um, both my mums and my nan who have passed now. Um, their photos are on the screen there. Um, I was lucky enough to have my birth mum Millie in my life only for three years. Um, I'm now 41, but mum passed away when I was three. She was just 28. Um, but lucky for me, I grew up, um, you know, with a really strong Aboriginal family and kinship is really important to us. And um, mum had one sister, Denise. So that's a photo of myself and my mum there in the middle of the screen. Um, one of very few photos that I have, have of my mum and I and um, everyone that knows me and sees me says that I'm just like her in every way, not just looks, but everything about me. But mum had one sister so the photo to the right of that where I'm in little stripy shirt is mum Denise and uh, mum raised me as her own so when my mum passed away mum Denise stepped in and she became my mum and she raised me as her own her three daughters became my sisters and my beautiful nan Delphine um, in the wheelchair there she was my absolute best friend and my rock and I had none in my life until I was 16 and um, forever grateful um, you know I guess for those three women for um, for raising me to be the strong proud uh, resilient Aboriginal woman that I am today I always extend my gratitude to them and thank them for their continuous guidance um, you know it's their resilience that I carry um, in me every day but it's also their sad stories and their struggles as well um, as we know that a lot of our Aboriginal people have suffered tremendously, um, you know, from the impacts of colonisation and the mistreatment of our people. You know, I reflect on yarns from mum, mum Denise telling me, you know, that the racism that she endured growing up in Walgett, um, not being allowed, you know, to go in pools and stalls. And, um, you know, she wasn't actually even a citizen of this country until she was 15 years old, um, which was pretty horrific. And some of the stuff that Nan went through, um, you know, by, the, by six years old, she'd lost both of her parents parents you know just to back then Aboriginal people were seen as a dying race and um and Nan actually was born on Warabinda Mission in Queensland originally actually and then moved back down to to Walgut where the rest of her mob were from but um she also lost her mum at three years old and mum, um, her mum passed away from introduced diseases and uh, my great-grandfather Rowley um, they called him captain. He, the police, he was a very clever old man and police wanted him to be a tracker and um, didn't, uh, you know, want to call him by his, by his cultural name and called him captain, which is where I get my name from. Um, and I'm married now, but I continue to keep my name because it keeps me strong. Um, a little bit about me. You can see a couple of uh, pics on there. Um, I'm a mum of two. I've got two beautiful children um, who are 18 and 22 now. Um, I was a mum at 19 to my son Tyrell and um, some photos of there of my home. So I grew up in Redfern and Waterloo, as April mentioned. I lived in those housing commission flats in, in Redfern, the inner city suburbs in, in, Water, in, in Sydney. Um, and I lived there for the first 20 years of my life. Um, my dad is a non-Aboriginal man, but I didn't really have a lot to do with him um, growing up. And I'm forever grateful, um, you know, that I 
was able to continue to grow up strong and proud uh, with my Aboriginal family. And um, there's a couple of pics there of Walgett. And um, my favourite photo there of down the right hand side is of my nan and my little nieces and nephews who are now grown adults, you know, and uh, they've got kids of their own. And um, but it's just it's, it's a happy time for me. And it it reminds me of the work that I do, that it's, it's to make a difference for our future um, generations. Um, a little bit of my journey, um, as April mentioned, you know, I um, I am an author now and I, I trained as a, a primary school teacher. I've worked um, in, in early intervention and child protection for a bit. Um, I've always wanted to do uh, do more and do a lot to, to make a difference for my people. Um, I'm a homeowner. I've travelled the world. I've done all these things, written books, but uh, that wasn't always my story. And um, I guess in my book, I was vulnerable enough to, to share my story and I've, I've never shied away from sharing my story because throughout my grief and my addiction and my trauma that I've endured, I've, um, I've learned from a lot of inspirational people by reading their books, by listening to their stories. And I thought to myself about eight years ago, well, what if, what if I was brave enough to share my story? And I thought, well, if other people can write books and so can I, and that's the mindset that I've had for a long time now and um, I'm definitely no writer I my book is um you know I share a lot of Aboriginal English and just as if I was telling yarns but um, that's you know I guess my journey so the photo up on the top left there is me as a little girl um, as I mentioned mum passed away when I was three and I lived in uh, housing commission flats in in Waterloo there and uh, you know back then um, in the 80s uh, Redfern and Waterloo was a really tough place um, it was a it was a community that struggled a lot there was a lot of drugs um, in my community Community, but it was also a community that was really strong and really resilient. I, um, you know, mum growing up, no one um, worked in my family. Um, you know, we, we, we struggled financially, uh, little things, you know, just like, um, you know, food and electricity and hot water and all those things you know we um we did it tough like every other um, family, you know, living in housing commission there and um, I guess in, in my community, it's um, drugs were pretty bad. And I remember back then I had three older sisters and I remember quite clearly um, some of the girls, you know, the young girls, teenagers, 15, 16 year old at the time were, um, were dying and they were passing away from um, heroin overdoses and um, yandi, marijuana and heroin and alcohol was really, really big in my community. Um, it probably it just felt like the normal thing to do you know um, you know there were drugs that were sold in my flat and often grown and you know it was kind of just all around me it was um, just you know I was surrounded by drugs and alcohol and um, I, I, I you know my older sisters had dropped out of school earlier as well and I had one sister Narelle who sadly passed away um, you know from addiction as well and she was only 30 um, but I, you know, she she made it through to year 10. And I always thought, well, if Narelle can make it to year 10, then I'm going to try my best to, to make it through to year 10. And um, but I just I found myself, it was just normal. I don't feel like it was something that it was a decision, um, you know, to start using drugs. It was kind of like all of us kids in the community, all of our families, everyone. It was just kind of, you know, I felt like I was just born into it. And I didn't really have any role models as well, um, you know, that I could look up to. And um, I wasn't sporty, I wasn't um arty or um you know into music and often the black fellas that I would see were, were really into these things and I didn't really see myself you know in the curriculum at school and I didn't know black fellas that you know that 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 were working and doing successful things um apart from you know I guess I had a few deadly AEOs at school but um you know in in my younger years I kind of always really struggled with uh, really low self-esteem in primary school I um was hospitalized for a lot of my primary school I suffered with a chronic skin condition called psoriasis and um, while it doesn't sound too bad but I was actually covered from head to toe um, and I'd be hospitalized for months um, I'd be bandaged up you know from head to toe uh, my, my daily routine was you know getting all of these creams and baths and ultraviolet light therapy uh, so I missed a lot of school so every time I'd go back to school I always felt like I was behind I uh, my my reading my maths everything I was at kid who just felt like I was the dumbest kid in class I didn't feel like I could ever achieve um fast forward to um, high school my attendance again was still patchy I was still suffering with with chronic psoriasis and I I struggled with psoriasis right up until my adult years um and it started to ease off as I got a little bit older and the treatment started to become a little bit better but it always affected my self-esteem and I think and I probably would have been 13 or 14 when I first started smoking yandy um 
I remember just trialing it. Um, it made me really, really sick. Um, but all of the friends, you know, we just did it for fun. Um, and I tried and I remember sitting in the gutter vomiting and feeling paranoid um, and feeling really sick from it. But I thought, well, everyone is using it. Everyone smokes Yandy. Everyone's on this. It must be something good about it. Um, so I started to dabble in it a lot more. And before I knew it, um, I was heavily addicted. I pretty much couldn't get out of bed in the morning and without having cones. All the drug dealers in Redfern and Waterloo by the time I was sort of 15, 16 knew me. Um, I would go and book up or get tick, you know, for a couple hundreds of dollars um, every fortnight. And I got to the point where it didn't matter how much I smoked, though I could not get stoned. I was just in severe addiction. And, um, and I just remember feeling really, really sad. And I got to the point where people were moving on to the next levels, you know, a lot of people were injecting heroin at the time, um, but also, um, you know, people were having snow cones. So I started to go down that path just to get a bit more of a hit. And I remember mum always telling me, you know, mum, we lived in Waterloo, you had the block, you know, that was really um, known for drugs and there was a lot of heroin in the community. And mum always tried to encourage me to stay away from heroin and going down that path. But I did start to dabble in it behind her back just to get my fix. And I remember just getting to this crossroads in my life going like, I didn't want to do that. And, I, you know, it was a teacher who made a difference for me. And at a very crucial time in my life, she saw me when I walked through the doors, you know, and I was in year 10, 15, going to school about two to three times a week, rocking in at about 11 o'clock, stoned. Um, and I remember just her saying to me, Kylie, I can't wait to see you until you're, you know, until you're in my Aboriginal studies class next year. You're going to be deadly. You're smart. And this woman never gave up. Every time I saw her, she'd say the same thing. And then I thought, geez, you know, I just remember this moment as like a light bulb moment. Um, she made me feel smart she, she noticed me she made me feel that I was capable and I started to think well what if what if this woman is right and what if I could potentially be the first person in my family to go on and get my HSC and get a deadly job um you know to make a difference I loved all my little nieces and nephews um but unfortunately you know to to support my addiction and just for basic necessities I was into stealing I remember getting caught in Grace Brothers. I was about 14, you know, pushing my little nephew around in a pram while I'm stealing clothes and socks and shoes and all sorts of things. And um, I remember getting caught by the police and going home, but feeling really proud because they didn't find the kids' socks that I had stashed under my arm. So I guess that was um, that was my normal life. And I always struggled. Um, my self-esteem was always low because I always, um, you know, suffered, still suffered with this really chronic skin condition. I didn't think that I would ever have a boyfriend, didn't think that anyone would love me. Um, and then I met my, I ended up at 17, I actually nearly died. I had a, um, I've actually got a life-threatening heart condition. So I've got a, an internal cardiac defibrillator. So, you know, those machines that, you know, people would zap you back if something was to go wrong with you. I've actually got one implanted within my chest. So the little electrical box sits on the left side of my chest and the wires are screwed into my heart. And in the event that my was to go into cardiac arrest, um, I've in, inherited a similar condition to my mum. I've got that there. And um, so I kind of have had, you know, a few heart surgeries in and out of hospital with my um with my psoriasis and um but I guess I did meet uh, the love of my life you know when I was 18 and there's a photo on the bottom there my little family photo of uh, my partner Richard at the time and um I was pregnant with my son Tyrell at 19 and I really feel that Tyrell saved my life um you know I think without him coming along when he did I can quite confidently say that I would be dead or in jail now that's pretty much the life that I was heading down um and, um, you know, we I kind of got it together, you know, um, stay at home mum for a couple of years. And then I remember, um, you know, people would judge us from Redford and Waterloo. And I remember um, even just applying for a few jobs, you know, when I was a teenager and people would look at my address and see where I'd lived. And, um, you know, they would judge me because, you know, um, just for being Aboriginal or not having the right clothes. Or I remember going for a job and, you know, they said, oh, you know, do you live in housing commission? Who do you live with? And um, pretty much sent me on my way, you know, just that that horrible um, stigma that was attached from growing up. Um, and it was just really, really frustrating. But my life did change for the better when I had my son. Um, so Richard and I spent the next eight years together. Um, he had a beautiful daughter, Alira, who came along four years later and um, life was cruising along okay. We had our own little housing commission place in Maroubra. Um, he was working, you know, looking after our kids, doing all the great things. And um, sadly, um, unexpectedly, you know, when I felt, you know, that life was sort of starting to get back on track um, after going through some other hurdles. And one thing I'll always say is that we all have a story and life is always going to give us a lot of hurdles. Um, you know, I'd lost my sister, as I mentioned, to addiction. Um, I became a carer at 
21, I was a full-time carer for my 12-year-old nephew. So docs were involved with my family, um, placed him in my care full-time. So here I was a 21-year-old with a two-year-old and a 12-year-old um, and then suffering the grief and loss from losing my sister as well. And that was um, really hard. Lost a best friend to suicide. All the things, you know, that happen in our lives and there's grief that continues to happen. But the one thing that really um, knocked me um, was was losing Richard so he passed away suddenly um, you know when, when my kids were just three and seven so overnight I went from all of a sudden feeling like life was kind of cruising along all right um, you know I was working at St George Bank at that time to all of a sudden becoming a single mum to my two little children and um, it was really, really tough. I didn't want to live, um, you know, I, I within those three weeks, I'd moved house a couple of times and um, was in pure survival mode, you know, when, when grief comes along and it can just, you know, you don't really know what to expect, especially something really significant like that. Um, I remember not wanting to survive, um, you know, feeling really, really depressed, um, thought of ways that I could quickly end it, but I thought about my little children the thoughts that were going through my head at the time were pretty severe, um, pretty um, scary, actually, when I think about them now. But thank God I um, managed to pull through. Um, I think back, you know, and in some of the things that I share in my book is uh, about journaling. It's around visualisation. And I'm going to share some of those tips with you. Um, and I hope that they might help you or help someone that you know. But one thing that I did is I just started to write down a couple of little goals. I started to visualise the life that I wanted um, I think when things, when bad things happen in our lives, we often just think about all the bad things that can continue to happen. I um, would close my eyes and bring myself to tears of happiness, just seeing my kids running, playing, swimming, just enjoying life like every other mother wants for their kids. And um, all of a sudden, because I'd worked for St. George Bank part time for six years at this stage, I said to myself, like, I want to start setting some goals. You know, I was tempted to go back down that path of, you know, drug use and alcohol and um but I know that I needed to make a difference for my kids and, and my little nieces and nephews and communities and I thought I'm going to set a really 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 big goal and if I can achieve this goal then I'm going to kind of feel almost superhuman you know because the goal that I'm going to set is something that people don't often um set you know I didn't know any other people in my community or my family that set this type of goal so working for St George Bank for six years I was helping everyone with their home loan applications and um, doing their finance support, you know, and that was a brave mood for me, you know, like I just walked in one day with my little boy in, in the pram and said, how do I go about getting a job here? And thank God the blonde woman behind the counter handed me a form and encouraged me to apply. And that that taught me so much about customer service, about, um, you know, just uh, working. I loved working there. I worked with all these old fellas, you know, they would always want to line up and see me on pension day. And I loved it. But the goal that I set after Richard had passed away was to buy my own home. <clears throat> um, and I set the goal to be one day be on the other side of that counter and applying for a home loan. So um, mum was still alive. Mum that raised me, mum Denise, she was still alive at this point. But two years after Richard had passed away, um, I ended up buying my own home. It wasn't that house that you can see on the screen there. I bought like a little townhouse in Greenacre in Sydney. And, um, and it was a dream come true for me. I went back to my bank after saving money and said, look, I'm working full time. By this stage, I'd moved on to another job working with, with docs in early intervention at that point, helping lots of other vulnerable families. But I've always said to myself, if somebody else can do it, then so can I. So as a single mum with my two little kids, I ended up, it was the proudest moment of my life going in and buying my own home. Um, and I remember taking my mum through and she was just so proud. Um, sadly, mum ended up passing away two years after Richard as well. So that was another big grief and a kick in the guts for me, um, supporting mum through her cancer and um, losing her as well. And I just felt like, you know, everyone in my close circle, um, I just kept losing it at some points, you know, I would just drop to my knees and cry and go and like, am I cursed? Like, why do all these terrible things keep happening? But I guess long story short, um, I have um, always tried to set goals and help people along, along the way. Um, I've since, you know, bought and sold um, homes, bought investment properties, travelled the world. I had a dream to take my kids to Disneyland. Um, you know, both of my kids have completed their HSC. Um, I ended up getting married. So I do, I do have a new husband now. I've completed a university degree. And that was also another big goal of mine. Um, you know, I, I worked full time, studied full time um, to study a, study a Bachelor of Education now I lead um, an Aboriginal education team that supports hundreds of schools across Southwest Sydney. Uh, met my husband, Jamie, in 2000. 
15, got married. Um, and now, you know, I guess um, here I am today as an author, um, you know, uh, a homeowner, um, someone that's traveled the world, um, been to incredible places. I did never think that I would ever make it out of Redfern and Waterloo or Walgut. You know, we'd go home to Walgut, but I've been to crazy places, you know, like Disneyland, the Bahamas, Greece, Canada, Thailand, New Zealand, Fiji. I'm very well traveled and I still um, pinch myself every day about these opportunities. Um, so that's my book. And I've also created a, a goal setting journal as well, um, which you can see on the screen there. It's called uh, Just My Dream Big Journal. In that journal, there's lots of prompts that I've put in. So I thought to myself, well, my book's a bit of a three type, th can sit on three different shelves. The first couple of chapters are a bit about my story. Um, this, there's a section, there's a chapter called uh, Black and Black and Proud. Um, it's about Aboriginality and it's about truth of our history and the importance of culture and family and connection. And then it's also an educational book as well. So I talk about the power of education and for teachers being, um, you know, being that teacher that makes a difference and, um, you know, never giving up on our kids, you know, and these days I live a life of freedom and choice. I still struggle, obviously, like all of us do with grief, but I'm someone, you know, that people who know my story, they know me as someone that's uh, very resilient and um, hopefully for as long as I'm alive, I will never give up. It's, um, it's, it's, it is a tough journey. Um, and I'm also co-writing um, book number two, as you can see on the bottom of the screen there, it's called Be That Teacher Who Makes a Difference and Lead Aboriginal Education for All um, Students. I don't know who I think I am because I'm definitely no writer, but um, I'm someone that has a couple of yarns to tell in hope that they might help others. And um, I was always, I was very, very scared as well to share my journey because people that know me now, you know, for the last 13 years, I've worked in education. I work with principals and directors and executive directors. Um, I was always afraid that if people really knew my story, then would people lose respect for me? Um, but I remember sending it to, you know, some of my directors and my, my uncles and stuff saying, this, this is who I am, you know, like this is my story and I'm going to share it because, I don't, I want to share it because so many teachers and people give up on our young people or they give up with those that are struggling with addiction and grief. Um, and, but I always believe that there's always hope and it doesn't matter how many times that we've tried, we can try again. You know, I've suffered with even smoking addiction. I remember I've tried to give up smoking probably a good 10 times before I was successful. Um, and I continue to, um, I think once you've got that, you know, addiction and, and even now, like I, um, struggle with my weight you know I'm a yo-yo dieter now I'll gain 10 kilos lose 10 kilos you know I think food is my drug of choice these days um but you know it's about trying to do some inner work to to really help um help you know just with, with knowing that it's always going to be there um but to really uh I guess continue on our path of self-improvement and it doesn't matter um how many times you know, that, that we've failed. There's always hope if we can just try again. And, you know, I always encourage everyone to imagine the what if, like what if that next time you try, um, what if it actually, what if you're successful? And I've, even recently I was out at um, a women's uh, rehab actually, and I did a workshop with them and they were using my journals and a lot of the women in there have read my book and the messages that I continue to receive from these women, just, they make me cry all the time, you know, because they're saying, oh, this chapter, I loved it. Because the, the last part of my book is like a self-help book. So I thought all the things that I've actually done to help me that perhaps they might help others. So I'm going to share a few of those tips with you as well uh, around um, mindset and goal setting and visualization and just really looking after ourselves as well. It's um we need to continue to, and I still have to do this self-care as well. And I guess my purpose now, you know, being an educator and I work in Aboriginal education is around Aboriginal education. Um, I'm really always sad and about the fact that um, so many young people go through our education system not knowing the truth about history. Um, I meet educators these days. I meet doctors, lawyers, everyone who tell, tell me that they didn't learn anything about our history. They might have learned the story of Captain Cook and about the convicts through education. So my job now is to, to teach the teachers, the principals, um, about how to, uh, I guess, um, have an inclusive curriculum where the truth is told, but not also just the bad stuff stuff and you know the sad stuff about our history but the rich and beautiful culture that's there for each and every one of us to share and my goal is to not let another cohort of our kids to go through the education system not knowing the truth of our country and also the the rich and beautiful culture that is there for all of us to share and I absolutely just get a real kick out of just helping people and um, I'm really really grateful that you know you've given me the opportunity to to share with you today
Um, and, you know, I guess um, I, that's a chapter of a book. It's called From Fear to Resilience. And um, I think once I found my resilience, and that's what I really want to encourage you guys to as well, is, um, is there's that fear, you know, that will always pop up because no one ever wants to fail. And fear often holds us back. We don't actually really want to jump in um, to really give ourselves, you know, I guess that 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 go at reaching towards our dreams and goals out of fear, fear of failure, even fear of success, you know, that that all pops. And then fear of judgment, even um, fear of success is a big one, you know, particularly if you're the first um, in your family or your community to kind of break that cycle as well. You kind of, we always wonder what other people are going to think of us. And, you know, I, I always um, worry, you know, of people, you know, you know, around you know being that that tall poppy syndrome you know are people going to think that I've forgotten where I come from but I guess you know since sharing my story all the work that I've done over the years um people just have nothing but respect for me um they know that I'm always going to be um true to who I am I'll never forget where I come from but what um I'll always continue to to share is that we do have I guess the ability to 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 choose a path and to to choose where we go um, in life, and um, I know that it's really hard. Some of us are, are dealt with um, really you know hard cards, and you know I know that the, in throughout my experience, I've always thought about the others who are, are far far worse off for me. And gratitude is something that I use each and every day to um, to support me. And you know when when things do get tough, and even recently I've had some sorry business and um, the death of people um, in my family. Um, but I continue to think about others, you know, out there that are doing it really, really tough. Um, and, you know, it's uh, that saying there that you can see, you know, I once heard the saying, either win or learn. And if we all use this analogy about life, you know, we'll begin to understand that it isn't always about winning. It's about learning and growing along the way and developing our strength along the way. So if you trial and you fail, that's OK. You know, there's always going to be something, you know, that, that you can learn um, from that experience. Um, the things that have helped me journaling and goal setting which is why I wanted to create my dream big journal um I've always just I don't know where I got it from um, but I just decided to pick up a piece of paper and a pen one day um and just to start journaling I just started to write down you know goals um you know short-term goals long-term goals um but also I was really specific in my goal setting in regards to what are the things that are potentially going to block up to stop me from reaching those goals? And then I would kind of pave the way to, you know, give me some ideas that if something pops up, then at least I've got this strategy to work towards as well. Um, vision boards. I'm a big believer in the law of attraction. I absolutely love um, creating vision boards. Um, this has got one here. I've just moved house actually. So everything's still all over the shop, but this was, um, you know, simple um, vision boards, you know, I've been building a house the last couple of years, I've been building a home, um, I've got my pool starting today, but I had my house and then I build a house, um, I've got my book, you know, write your book, just positive quotes, and over the years, um, I continue and I put it somewhere where I can see it, you know, and they look different all the time, but um. You know, it's it's something that I will often use because I think that if we can have those positive visuals um, that are there to remind us, particularly when times get tough, um, you know, it, it to me that's kind of um, been been a great thing that's really helped me. Um, asking for guidance, I think that's a really important thing as well. Not being shame, owning your story. Um, you know, don't shy away from it. I think that people can learn from our experiences and our stories. Um, you know, and you know, i I've got a lot that I'm ashamed of. I've got a lot. You know, I've stolen off people. I've done really terrible things in my younger years and um, not just stealing from shops and things like that, but from actual people, which has been really, really difficult. Um, and I've had to do a lot of inner work to kind of forgive myself and reach out, you know, to my old people and the universe and, you know, just to, to help me with, with that forgiveness of myself as well. Um, positive affirmations. I continue to. Um, I, I, Louise Hay is the queen of positive affirmations. I've got positive affirmations in my book as well. And um, if, every single day, I tell myself, you know, Kylie, you are good enough and you're smart enough. Because often I think, well, who am I to be writing a book and to be buying a home and to doing all these deadly things? And I feel like I'm living a life that wasn't destined for me, you know, with. Um, but I have to con continue to tell myself that I am worthy and, and that I deserve these things and I've worked hard for them. 
it's really important that we select our circle. I know that when I was, you know, making change through my addiction, and I guess it didn't stop when I was a teenager, I've, I've continued to kind of, my thoughts go there, and I have dabbled in going back down that space, you know, over the years, but I've been able to quickly stop myself and to reach out and ask for help. And I think that the team at SMART, you know, and the work that you guys do is absolutely incredible, you know, and, and um, I think it's, you know, I remember even just when I was quitting smoking, for example, I reached out to the quit line um, and some of those things that I learned from those strategies, like those four Ds, I apply them to my life when I'm helping other people now through addiction, I kind of share some of the strategies, you know, so don't ever be shamed to reach out for help. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's no shame in, in putting your hand up and ask for help. We need to all continue to do that. Um, and selecting a circle, um, you know, I'm supporting my nephew at the moment who's recently got out of jail. I've got nieces and nephews and community members who suffer with addiction and mental health. And I always tell them that if they're trying to make a positive change, you need to select your inner circle. Um, and you can't, you can't be hanging out with the drug dealers or you can't be hanging out with your mates who are taking drugs or doing things that are negative because it's going to be really difficult for you to stay on your path. So it's really important that until you're strong enough, you need to make sure that you select your circle, one that is really positive. Um, the five second rule, um, I, I talk about that in my book and that's basically just about, you know, um, when you've got, you got, got that temptation, you know, whether it's about, you know, putting your alarm on in the morning to get up, to, you know, to go for a walk in the morning um, or to, you know, to if that temptation comes there, it's about just taking a deep breath and waiting five seconds and doing all these little things, which I do share in my book. And I'm, um, I, I, you know, I'm no exercise queen. I'm someone that struggles with gym and weight gain, weight loss. But I do know um, that uh, if I start my morning right, um, it can definitely change the trajectory of my entire day. Um, I call it my gem mornings, so journaling. So just even 10 minutes of journaling, writing down the things that I'm grateful for, a couple of goals, um, the meditation. I always thought that was for, you know, these gurus, but it's just visualizing the day that I want and just quieting my mind enough to, um, I guess, visualize and create a movie in my mind about the life or the goal that I'm wanting to achieve. So I remember when I was buying my home, um, I've used the law of attraction my entire life. I always encourage people to go and watch The Secret. It's on Netflix, um, but it's about, you know, positive thoughts and visualizing what you want to achieve. So um, having this really incredible movie in your mind, and I would often bring myself to tears with um, of joy, just visualizing the things, you know, that I would actually want to see happen. Um, let me quickly just go through um, The Secret. So that's probably my favorite book of all time, um, you know, and The Secret is about the law of attraction. It says, you know, that we're only limited by our imagination. Thoughts become things. People often think I'm a little bit wombo, you know, Kylie, you can't just, you know, think yourself into these amazing things that are happening. But I believe that there's no harm in um, thinking positively and taking the time to really visualize whether it's quitting smoking yarn, quitting drugs, quitting, you know, getting a job that you want, closing your eyes for five minutes and just visualizing the outcome you want, I feel is a really powerful tool. Um, believing miracles and, and the power of gratitude, you know, I think we often think about the things that we don't have, um, you know, in our lives, whether it's the relationships that, that, you know, that we want aren't there or material things or housing, those are necessities that we need. Um, but being grateful for the things that you do have, um, I think is really important. And I'll often just write down a gratitude journal or go throughout my day and reflect on the things that I'm grateful for, especially when things get tough. Um, so there are just a few of my little deadly secrets to success. Um, as I've mentioned, you know, this is a little bit about me now. I'm I feel I have, you know, I feel like I've broken the cycle, being the first in my family to, to finish my HSC to get a uni degree. Both of my kids are now um, followed in my footsteps, and I've got a lot of others in my my school, in my community um, that say, well, if Arnie Kai can do it, then so can I. And um, that's I'll continue to try to be brave to inspire and give hope to others as well. Um going I always say that time waits for no one you know and um that that I always um you know that that we need to take action now and uh sadly you know for those you, you know that they that sometimes life can be turned upside down you know and I've recently lost um some people who are really close to me um and it just really 
puts into perspective, you know, that that we need to take action now and we don't know how long we're going to be around for. So, um, you know, I always had this fear of turning 28 because my mum who raised me was always fearful, you know, that maybe I wouldn't make it past 28. And um, that, that, that saying that time waits for no one is really important to me because so many in my family have passed away really young. You know, the father of my kids, Richie, was only 30. My sister was 30. My mum was 28. My other mum was 59. My nan, who I thought was really, really old, was only 65. Um, so I think, you know, we just need to be really, really grateful. So there are a few of the tips, you know, goal settling, set, setting and journaling, um, vision boards and the power of visualisation. Um, and, you know, my book, as I mentioned, is titled Dream Big and Imagine the What If. What if you actually had a go and what if things do turn out right? It's really important that we never give up. Um, I've, on my website as well, which I'm going to share a link to afterwards, um, for those of you, if you want to have a look at my book or my journal, but I also have in the store, there a free goal setting tool, uh, which you can download. It's just a, basically a free PDF. So you could pop in if you're interested in buying the book or the journal, um, please do so. Otherwise, um, yeah, like I said, you can just pop in that this is the free goal setting tool. It's got some um, things that you can break down there. And these are some of the things, you know, it's got a little commitment page, uh, fast forwarding, writing a letter to your future self. Um, giving thanks to the universe or your ancestors, your old people, um, and lots of those little goal setting prompts there as well and really um, breaking it down. Um, the things that I know for sure is that everyone deserves a champion. Our kids need champions. Each and every one of us deserve a champion. Um, hopefully you've got someone, you know, even the team at SMART are there to support you, but um, it feels good as well when you can use your experience to help others along the way. So don't ever be shamed of what you're going through or what you've been through. Trust your in intuition. I always follow my gut um, my gut will always guide you and tell you you know and just to and quieten your mind enough um, to allow you to be able to um, to really focus on where you need to be and believe in miracles you know sometimes it's you know if we've got this mindset you know that bad things keep happening they're going to keep happening I believe that's will continue to happen otherwise if we can change our mindset and believe that things can change and things will get better I believe that you'll magically attract that into your life. YOLO, I've got teenagers. Um, you know, you only live once. I don't go around crazy living a crazy life now, but I want to live my life um, to the best. And I want to um, get to the end of my life knowing that I was brave and I was resilient. And I've hopefully made a difference to the lives of others. Get outside, you know, and just breathe. I think it's really important that we continue to look after ourselves, getting out in nature, going for that walk, taking a deep breath. Um, imagine, you know, I love a good old cup of tea and a chicken soup. I've got my deadly chicken soup recipe in my book. Um, they're things that are just good for the soul. It's really important that we um, that we look after um, ourselves, smiling at each other, smiling at strangers, you know, and just how that kindness will be um, reciprocal. You know, you'll get that back. What you give is what you get, you know. So give and I know that you will receive. Um, and just those compliments, you know, how much we need to continue to compliment each other and support each other. And don't be afraid to try something new. So if you've never tried journaling before, if all the stuff that I'm, um, you know, talking about sounds a little bit foreign to you, I encourage you to give it a go. Um, like I said, there's a really great documentary. It's on Netflix or on YouTube called The Secret. Um, I absolutely love it. And I talk about a lot of that stuff in my book as well. Um, and just that mindset, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. Um, so it's up to you in regards to, you know, what you want to do and, and where you want to go. I'm going to just watch the time here. Um, yeah, just about, you know, we all have a role to play to teaching um, and inspiring others to, to, you know, believe in themselves and chase their dreams and to think about, you know, who you can be a champion for. Um, this is a beautiful quote by Oprah. The biggest adventure that you can take is, um, is to live the life of your dreams. Um, and I love Oprah. I love her book. It's um, one of my favorites called, you know, what I know for sure, not being shame, visualizing, really backing yourself um, and, you know, in just understanding that you can um, be in control of your future. A few of my favorite quotes are the one in the middle, I'm just going to quickly read to you. Um, and it's out of A Course in Miracles. And it just says, you know, like I'm a really, I'm very um, intuitive. I like to reach out and still continue to talk to my mom and my nan and my ancestors um, in the universe. And I always just ask, you know, I'll always be guided. But that little quote says, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What would you have me say and to whom? Um, I always believe that we'll land where we're meant to be. And um, wherever you are in your life right now, you're potentially, everything's happened for a reason and you'll continue to be guided. Um, goals and mantras, you know, um, the positive affirmations, you know, um, you know, just to um, continue to know that and back yourself and tell yourself whether you need to put little um, positive affirmations in your bathroom or just have it on your vision board. I think that they're extremely important. 
Um, that's me as a little girl there. Um, but just, you know, showing up and doing your absolute best and don't ever try to compare yourself with others. You know, your goal just might be to be the best mom or the best dad that you can be or to be a hairdresser or a tradie or whatever it might be. There's no um, competition, you know what I mean? And, and how boring would this world be if um, we're all the same? Um, positive affirmations. Um, this is one of the couple that I put in my book as well. I, 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 we have to forgive others, you know, and a lot of us that are on this journey of, you know, addiction and sadness, um, there's probably been a lot of hard times and a lot of people that have hurt us, but I always believe that we just need to let go of that pain. We need to let go of that hurt. So I've put some of those um, affirmations in there, you know, and I forgive those who have caused me pain. I choose to forgive in order to love, to receive love and positivity. I'm strong and resilient and I choose to live my life on my terms, not anybody else's um these are my babies um they're a little bit um older now tyrell's now 22 and that's who um april um worked with at ncie there and alira's always in there dancing around now she dances um with brolga dance academy and um but yeah look there um, my greatest achievements in life a couple of little um quotes there just remember you know we can or i can and we will um they often say you know that i dream too big and i say that they they think too small so i'll continue to read myself and myself and i really encourage you to do the same and i know that we are stronger together you know we're together with the mob at smart there and um you know i think that you're all absolutely amazing i've probably um that's pretty much the end of mine but look that that is my book that is my journal um that qr code if you are interested in having a look at it, the qr code will take you to my website um if you want a little bit about me or my story but look i just want to express my um sincere um gratitude um and appreciation to um april and to dan and the entire team at smart recovery for allowing me the opportunity to share a little bit about my journey um i do apologize if i've probably gone on a little bit too long um once I get yarn and I can go all day. So um, I'm really sorry if I did go over, but um, I might just hand back over to um, to April now and, and to Dan. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for, for giving me this, this time to share. Oh, thanks. Yes, I'm, I'm glad I had my camera off because um, there was, yeah, some moments there of just um, tears, but um, just, yeah, incredibly um, proud to um, sit in this circle with you and, and hear your story and, um, you know, I, we can't be what we can't see and I think it's so important that um, we share these these stories. I, I had a couple of questions. I know some have come in um, from, from the chat, but um, you talk a lot about um, grief and, and being in that survival mode. And um, in the SMART program, we talk, uh, you know, point four is about living that balanced lifestyle. And, um, you know, even if we're going through the tough times and, and dealing with sorry business, um, how do you live a balanced lifestyle now? Um, I know you, you talked about the exercise, and um, but yeah, what would be your advice to some of our participants about, Talking about exercise? I need to get out. We haven't done that for a while, but I, I just I basically gratitude. Honestly, like the first thing I do, the minute my feet hit the ground in the morning, I just say thank you. I'm just so grateful, and I think the more that I'm grateful. Um, I just, it just, it just, everything else just comes into perspective, you know, and, and recently we've been through some really significant, sorry, business, you know, and um, I just kept just saying, you know, like just focusing on the things that I've been really grateful for, but, and, and I have to block out, you know, sometimes I, I want to help everyone, you know, I want to go and be this woman that helps everyone, but, you know, and I, we're always good, good, good at giving advice to other people, you know, around looking after yourself first. And I, I really feel that like lately I've started to practice that because I know that if I don't look after me, I'm no good to anyone else. So sometimes I've just had to really, really switch off, you know, whether it's from social media for a while or if there was something that was out of my control and I couldn't do, I just need to focus on the things that I can control. But gratitude, definitely just closing my eyes and just giving thanks for every little thing that I have. Um, I always try to bring myself just to back back to being healthy, um, try to get out for a little walk. I'm really hopeless at it, but I know that when I do, it just gets all those positive endorphins happening. Um, I know it works. Um, yeah. And just... And, and, and reaching out and have, trying to have someone that you can just reach out and have a good yarn. Like I've got my deadly cousin, Bronwyn, who we're both Womba and crazy together, you know, and we've just still laughing about the same things that we were, you know, from teenagers. And sometimes I just have to pick up the phone to her and go, sissy, you know, like I'm not feeling good. And just having one person, I think, just to reach out and don't ever suffer in silence. Mm. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very, very inspirational. Um, 
Another couple of questions. We've got a, a little bit more time. Um, so feel free if anyone has another one to, to ask. Um, this is, I can tag two questions together <laughs> to save time. Um, so stigma is, is, is a big challenge, you know, when people are trying to move away um, from addiction, the cycles and the mindsets that yourself and other people have. What have you done to deal with that journey and how would you encourage others to? And I guess the tag on is, how can we develop better resilience? Because I think that's the big part of moving through that stigmatization. So stigma, you mean, so from telling people the stigma about drug addiction and yeah. yeah it could also be yourself. I mean, people have a lot of stigma towards themselves, but I think it's because it's, it's, it's maybe the drug policy or maybe mm -hmm. the stuff that people in their lives that see, they don't yeah. see the true value or identity of what someone can be. And I guess yeah. that's a struggle that pushes them and suppresses them down, you know. I know. I just personally, um, you know, I always feel that the more we try to suppress it or if we try and hide it, it's kind of always going to be inside just bubbling, you know, and we kind of um, we will often feel like frauds. Do you know what I mean? Like you're where, where, you know, for example, you start a new job and you're worried about stigma that that's attached to your past life or things like that. I really feel like truth telling um, is really important for me. Truth telling about our story, really owning our story. Um, for me, I will always, um, you know, I'm not shame about owning my story. And I always encourage anyone, you know, like I've got my nephews and people who I work with now, they go, oh, but I can't do this because I've done this. I'm like, just be honest. Do you know what I mean? Everyone deserves a fair go and everyone has the opportunity to start again. So I just think as long as you're honest and you're genuine, people at the end of the day are human um, and we have to forgive and we have to be able to nurture and care for, for people. So I would always say that and if, if, if there is stigma or if there's judgment or if there's something attached to it, go and find someone else. Do you know what I mean? If it, whether it's your workplace or your community or the people that you're working with, I just feel that you have to own, own your story and your truth because I think that's something really powerful, you know, in, in, in storytelling and just owning, you know, I just absolutely love hearing from people's story of overcoming, um, you know, trauma, sadness, grief, addiction. Um, I just look at them like they're superheroes for me, you know, like I'm just like far out, you guys are deadly, you know, like that's, don't ever be shamed. To, that's my advice. Oh, share it. I think it's healing. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree not to go into personal story, but I've, I've gone through that journey myself through recovery and and it was that being able to share that story was reinforcing not only to me, but inspiring to others. And, and actually, if you weren't interested, I don't want any part of that relationship. I'll move on because yeah. I think it just continually, and the people that come through smart meetings and you see the strength, the resilience and the determination and the, you know, that, that is inspiring and it should be spoken at. It's inspiring to everyone because we're, everyone's dealing with this stuff. It's just the output slightly differently. We're all dealing with this stuff. We're just not able to share it when I we struggle through. That's why I love smart so much that any behavior we know we can we can be inspiring from. So um another quick question here is okay. And you know, in smart recovery means it's very uh, key to to goal set, you know, and in, in the next week we really concentrate on the next week. What's one thing you can do? What would you do, encourage? And I'm sure it's in your book. <laughs> um to set, to help encourage people to set goals in their lives? I think start small. Start small and go slow. And I think once you, you know, just a little small goal, it could just be in the next week, you know, you're going to start trying to do something or stop trying to do something. And I think once you get the taste of that, um, actually achieving the goals, for me, it, it, can be, it's, it can become a little bit addictive. You could actually become addicted to setting goals. And I think that's actually I've, I do have an addictive personality, you know, and I think now I just have these addictions to doing good things and what else can I achieve? Well, if I can do that, then I, maybe I could do this and what else could I do? So I just think, you know, starting really, really small, um, you know, sometimes, you know, I do set a dream big and, you know, really dream about your wildest dreams and put it out there if someone else can do it. But importantly, um, and on that goal setting tool, which is a free download as well on my website um, and in my journal, starting small just a couple of little goals and being really proud you know reward yourself um for when you do achieve those goals it could be something really really small I know I was talking to one of the sisters earlier today and um she hasn't had a smoke for 25 days and I'm like wow like that's so deadly you know like that is just amazing um so little things you know just celebrating it and if you hear about someone else you know that's achieved a goal like that 
just get around and just really support each other. I think that's um yeah we 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 we, we takes takes the community and we all need to to be there to celebrate and, and support each other as well. And I, and I think as you said, uh, just owning your mistakes and actually I'm trying to encourage my own son at the moment whose resilience is just really low. Like actually making mistakes is a really really good thing, Jackson, because it actually helps you grow areas that you you, you feel like you know are, are slightly weaker than others, and it identifies uh, you know a, a, a perfect opportunity for learning. Um, just one comment that uh, uh, Liz made here, um, which was really true. Sometimes it can be difficult for people in active addiction to share the story, and we've had stories of people doing that, and actually employers and people flattering you know it can be difficult but I think Liz as we know this is why we create spaces like smart recovery so that you can come with like-minded people and be able to share that story and inspire uh, in these meetings to the point where you know you feel strong enough to to, to be brave and, and get out there and and then uh, share uh, your your experiences um, yeah, I understand that one as well because it's taken me a long time like I've worked in education now for 13 years I've been working for the last 20 years and um ooh. and um yeah it's only like I've you know people I've started to share my story but it definitely wasn't wasn't something that I was happy to go and share straight away it's taken a, a while for me to actually really own it so you'll know when the right time is and you know whatever works for you I think that what works for one person potentially won't work for the others but I think just really follow your gut um and know that if the time is right and if you if you feel comfortable to share it um then I think each each to their own um I work with a lot of really vulnerable young people now and I was brave enough to share because I'm sick of people giving up on our kids. I'm sick of seeing the incarceration rates and the comments, you know, that are made about their family or community or where they're going to end up in life. And I'm just like, no, um, you know, it stops with us. So I think, yeah, everyone's on a, on a journey. Um, so whatever works for you. But I think having a safe place, whether it's, you know, with Smart or with a group of friends to really just share those things. I think talking and supporting each other is really important. Absolutely. And uh, I just shared the slide again there if anyone's interested in uh, following or continue to follow Kylie's journey or be inspired or, uh, you know, it's a very short, short snippet of what we've heard today. Uh, you know, don't apologise because we're all wanting more. Um, but here's an opportunity to uh, to do that if anyone needs that. Or you can just go to your website, kyliecaplin.com.au. Um, I will hand, hand over to April shortly. She can wrap proceedings up. Um, but just wanted to highlight um, services and opportunities if there are people um, attending today. Obviously, at Smart Recovery website. Um, there are meetings. There are different avenues uh, to gain support. But also, if anything you know has come up, you know, we're aware that these difficult things and stories can trigger things in people sometimes. So just know that there is help out there. Uh, on the screen, as you say, um, and never be alone in those journeys that we're struggling with. So, but um, from me, and I'm sure April will wrap up. I thank you so much for um, your time today. It's very inspiring. It and can continues to remind me of of my own journey through that. And uh, you know, it's uh, it's fantastic. And to know there are people attending these meetings. There are people earlier on that journey uh, that hope find some strength from these stories and inspirations. So. Uh, thank you from me. Thanks, Dan. Um, I, I wanted to leave the final word um, to you, Kylie, and it, it's a quote in your book, um, and, and you say, we're all teachers, every single one of us. Um, what do you mean by that, and, and why is it important to all of us um, in recovery? Uh, like I said, I just think that we're all on this journey of life together. Um, and, you know, I, I am a teacher now, you know, I work in education, but our families, our communities, owning your story, there's always something that we can teach others, whether it's about resilience, whether that's, you know, um, something that you've learned along the way, you know, each and every one of us are very different and unique in our own ways. And I just feel that the more that we can teach and share and um, our beautiful gifts with each other, um, you know, we're going to be able to help help many others, you know, so really finding out, you know, what it is that 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 makes you unique. And you may not know it now, but I'm hoping that you'll take the time to reflect to write down all the qualities about yourself and find opportunities to, to teach or to share that with others because I honestly believe that um, that each and every one of us has a very unique gift and we're all here for a reason and it's about just kind of quieting our mind to, to allow us to to see what that what that is and um, I really feel that you know I've I've been through all this stuff but 
I'll never change it for the world. You know, the grief, the sadness for everything, because I feel like it was meant to be. And maybe I just had to go through all that because I'm here, hopefully to help others. Sorry, I get a bit teary. <laughs> No, no, I need to apologise. It's uh, it's very uh, emotional thing. That's that's a good thing. So, yeah. um, but thank you again. Thank you everyone for for joining us. I said we'll, we'll, the recording will be available. We'll try and get on our website. There are other webinars on our website. There are other webinars we try to run uh, either monthly or bi monthly. So, um, please check them out. And uh, yeah, thank you again. And uh, have a rest of a great week, folks. So. Thank you, everyone. Honestly, I just um, so much gratitude and appreciation for the work that you do. And I wish you all well um, on your journey. Um, and yeah, stay deadly and uh, sing out and reach out if you need any support. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye.